So it's a great uh, privilege uh, uh, to have the Bok uh, Prize uh, ceremony that we give every year from the astronomy department. And uh, before we get to the talk itself that uh, will accompany the ceremony, I wanted to mention a few uh, words of background. Uh, first, we have the privilege and, and, and pleasure to host the grand great-granddaughter uh, uh, of uh, <laughs> Bart Bock, uh, 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 Abigail, and her mother, Gay, right? And, and at dinner, we will have also the, the father, Alexander, yeah, right? Another, another <laughs> <laughs> um, so a few words about uh, the Bock family. Um, as you may have heard, uh, uh, Bart Bock is, was a, a, a Dutch-American uh, astronomer. Uh, he worked mostly on the structure and evolution of the Milky Way. Uh, in particular, he discovered the Bok globules that uh, uh, looked very strange at the time. They looked like um, the, the cocoons of uh, insects uh, on the sky, and uh, it wasn't clear what, what is inside. And uh, he conjectured that these might be sort of like a womb that, that makes new stars in it. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a conjecture because you couldn't see through them, they were opaque. And uh, uh, then later when infrared astronomy developed, uh, people could tell that indeed stars are being made in these globules. And so that was a very important discovery about the way that nature makes stars. We see stars, we didn't know where they come from. So that was an important uh, aspect of figuring it out. And uh, I should mention that he married uh, a, a fellow astronomer that was actually, uh, who was a senior than, than he was at the time, Priscilla Fairfield, uh, in 1929. Um, and uh, he passed away, uh, Bart Bork, uh, in 1983. But, but before that, he, he was named an asteroid after him and, uh, and his wife, uh, Priscilla. And he thanked the International Astronomical Union for giving him a little plot of land uh, that uh, he, where he can retire and live on. So that was his... <laughs> um, just a few words about his background. He was born in a small Dutch town uh, of uh, Hoorn, uh, north of Amsterdam. Uh, and then uh, uh, Priscilla was uh, an associate professor in astronomy. And the young uh, Bart Bock was assigned to her reception committee. He was a graduate student, uh, 10 years younger than she is, uh, and fell in love with her. And the rest is history. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, the following year, he uh, uh, broke off his thesis studies at, at uh, Groningen and uh, moved across the Atlantic to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we are, uh, on the invitation of Harlow Shapley, the director of the Harvard College Observatory at the time, and um, a couple of days after moving to the U.S. Uh, on September 9th, uh, 1929, so uh, 91 years ago, um, two days after moving to the U.S., um, uh, they were married here. So um, this caused uh, an unusual circumstances uh, here. Um, uh, in a way, but uh, both of them continued to work together. And they remained at uh, Harvard University for 30 years, from uh, 1929 to 1957. Um, and they had uh, two children, uh, a son, John Fairfield, and a daughter, Joyce Annette. So here we are looking at... John. Exactly. Um, okay, so that's uh, history. And uh, I just wanted to mention a few words about this year's uh, recipient, Jack Steiner, sitting over there. You don't need to stand up yet. <laughs> uh, so Jack actually did his PhD uh, in the astronomy department at Harvard, finished, uh, graduated in uh, 2012, right? Uh, worked primarily with uh, Ramesh and uh, McClintock, Jeff McClintock, but with both of you, I, I guess. Um, yeah, you will tell, um, primarily with, with Jeff. Um, 
And then uh, he uh, was uh, a postdoc at uh, the University of Cambridge, the other Cambridge, the original Cambridge, um, in 2012, and then um, came uh, as a Hubble Fellow to the C Center for Astrophysics in 2012 for three years, and then um, went to Paris, uh, right? You were there, yeah. but uh, you decided to come back to MIT, uh, and uh, he was a, an Einstein uh, postdoc fellow at MIT, and then uh, uh, most recently he became an astrophysicist at the Chandra X-ray Center here at the Center for Astrophysics. And Jack, and Jack has a lot of important uh, scientific results to his credit uh, that over the years earned him uh, many awards in addition to this one. Um, uh, he received the Harvard the Merit Fellowship in 2010, the Farman Prize in 2012, just to show that the astronomy department does uh, appreciate talent uh, that later matures and, and becomes ever more prominent. Um, and uh, obviously he also received prize fellowships like the Hubble Fellowship, Einstein Fellowship, and so forth. Um, and um, I wanted to ask Abigail to help me with uh, the award. So just a few words about Abigail. Um, she works uh, as a grant uh, writing manager um, at uh, Root Capital. And um, um, earlier she pursued a graduate degree at the University of Oxford. And um, she has a lot of talents based on what I read, uh, but <laughs> I don't want to embarrass her by uh, spelling all of them out. <laughs> but I would like to ask Abigail to say a few words first, yeah. uh, and then uh, we'll move on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today, um, representing my family. Um, we are not astronomers anymore, which I think is sad, but um, it's exciting to be here. And one of the kind of legends of Bart Bach that I've been taught my whole life was how he had such a passion for sharing astronomy with the public. Um, and with communicating it and uh, really promoting science um, as much as he could to people who are total lay people. And I find a sort of beautiful poetry in the fact that I, a perfect lay person, am being welcomed by you all in, at this amazing event. Um, and I really think that it makes me feel um, very proud to know that um, Bart's legacy and Priscilla's legacy is still um, very much alive here today. So thank you. Thank you. All we can say is that you carry his um, biological DNA. <laughs> we are trying to carry his academic yeah. DNA here. Yeah. And every year we try to reward the previous um, uh, graduate student uh, of ours that did very well later on, uh, recognize the important work that was done. So maybe we should ask uh, Jack to come over and... Uh, I'm pleased to present the Bach Prize. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And this is oh, you. to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so Jack uh, will speak today about measuring spins of stellar mass black holes, a very timely subject. Uh, and he's doing it with X-ray spectroscopy. Well, I, I first want to begin by saying um, thank you so much to the Bach family uh, for, for this honor. Um, thank you to the department for this honor. And uh, I'm very excited to be able to share to you, share, share with you um, what for me has been um, the most exciting and rewarding of uh, scientific um, adventures to embark on, um, which is delving into the spins of stellar mass black hole systems. And um, for me, this is uh, a very, uh, it's, it's not only a scientifically fulfilling subject, but it, uh, at this moment has a very deep uh, personal connection to me. Um, Jeff McClintock uh, was my advisor for my, my thesis work that I'm, um, the basis for what I'm going to be telling you today. Jeff died just a little over two years ago. And um, for those of us here who knew him, he was, the paragon of what we look for in a scientist. He was uh, someone who um, had such passion and such joy in 
the the sense of discovery more so than than anyone I can think of. And uh, Jeff loved data with just uh, uh, an incandescent uh, fury that was just it, it was so much fun to to dive into problems with him. So this is of course a picture from Jeff later in his career. Uh, I'm showing you a picture of Jeff uh, early in his career here, where he was uh, and uh, off the coast of Africa at the launch of Uhuru, a telescope that he helped uh, build, design, and uh, was a part of all the way through. Um, and uh, it was one of my joys to be able to uh, share with Jeff um, my experience of being involved in the launch of NICER and uh, the adventure of sort of a new instrument making discoveries on the sky uh, shortly before he died. So I wanted to uh, share this picture with you, as well as to say that um, I first encountered Jeff in 2006, uh, starting off as a fledgling grad student in this department. And the way I encountered him was Jeff was giving the colloquium here, where I'm standing now, uh, telling us about a new enterprise he was starting to work on, and he was looking for new graduate students. He had made some of the first measurements of black hole spin, and he was presenting work on GRS 1915, which is a source I mentioned uh, earlier today in my lunch talk, a very uh, exciting and dramatic black hole system. And he was introduced by Ramesh, who called Jeff Mr. Black Hole, which is a fantastic superhero name. And <laughs> And that is really Jeff to a T, but, um, but his, his superpower was not about black holes. It was actually, his superpower was the ability to inspire in others his intense joy for science. Um, and uh, he would be delighted to be here today. And I, uh, except for maybe this description of him, I'm sure he would have been embarrassed. But um, I, I'm uh, sharing with you all of these results that he nurtured and, uh, and had such joy and passion for. And, at the end of this, I hope you'll come away with a bit of a sense of what uh, Jeff viewed as the capstone on his wonderful career. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, while I have control of my emotions, let me dig into the science of this, uh, which is first I want to tell you a little bit about uh, X-ray binary systems, which are uh, the environments in which these black holes uh, that I'm going to tell you about live. Uh, we only know about them. But we, we think there are many uh, tens, hundreds of millions of black holes roaming around our galaxy, but unless they're interacting with some close neighbor companion, they're completely invisible to us. So uh, uh, these X-ray binary systems are our window into the behavior of black holes in our galaxy. And I'll tell you about how we go about measuring their mass as a quick uh, primer, and then on to how we go about measuring their spin. So a typical X-ray binary system schematically looks something like this, where there's a companion star which may be overflowing its, its Roche lobe, uh, uh, giving a stream of gas that feeds onto the black hole uh, through an accretion disk. Now, typical size scales here are that uh, the accretion disk and the companion star separation from uh, the black hole will be a few solar radii. So these are really generally quite uh, compact systems, closer in than... Uh, uh, than the Earth is to the Sun. Um, and all of the X-ray emission that comes from these systems comes from something like 100 miles uh, within uh, 100 miles from the very center of the singularity that is the black hole. So this is a very compact systems that emit enormously. These uh, prodigious black hole systems can outshine the Sun by a factor of a million in X-rays, uh, all in X-rays. So th these are tremendously bright, tremendously compact, uh, and they are some of the most mysterious objects in our universe, uh, the subject of scrutiny by not only astronomers, but by fundamental physicists in science fiction, in literature, uh, and um, in philosophy. So these black holes are born in the supernova deaths of some of the most massive stars that are formed in these sorts of... Uh, uh, beautiful OB associations where the most massive stars are born, live for several million years, and then go supernova. And the most massive of these systems, we think, uh, produce black holes as remnants from their dense cores. We know of something like 50 black hole candidates in our galaxy that we've discovered over time since the dawn of X-ray astronomy in the late 1960s. And this is showing you a compilation of a subset of these. This, is, this plot is now uh, somewhat out of date. Um, uh, 
this was made by collaborator Jerry Arose. Need to ask him to um, update this with a, a few new add-ons. But this is showing you a subset of those 50 that are the dynamically confirmed black hole candidates. So that is, these are systems for which we have made a, a lower limit estimate of the mass of the compact primary, and we know it's above the threshold for a neutron star, so it is a black hole. And you see that these are roughly divided into two camps. Up here, there are these very large companion star uh, uh, wind-fed massive um, systems. And down here, there are systems for which the companion star is generally redder, smaller, and the disk uh, of the black hole is oftentimes larger than, um, than the companion star. These are all Roche lobe filling, and they're transient, so they go off for about a year and then are in deep quiescence for decades, maybe centuries. These are all persistent systems fueled by the wind of the close companion star. And when we observe these systems, uh, as we have for uh, with over 16 years with a great uh, Rossi X-ray timing explorer instrument, we see that the uh, variety of behavior that black holes exhibit is enormously rich. So this is something like a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram uh, for black hole systems in the X-rays. This is showing you the hardness on this axis and the intensity on this axis. So this is uh, in detector units. So uh, every one of these points would be modulated in principle by the, the distance to the black hole. But this is showing you some 30 black holes uh, superimposed all of their behavior over RxDE's 16-year history. And, and this is comprised of many Q-shaped curves where an individual black hole went into an individual outburst, rose in a hard state, transitioned to a soft state, declined, and came back to a quiescence. I've, uh, I'm showing you not just the behavior of these systems, but also encoding in um, a rainbow of color here. This, this color is telling you something about the flicker noise of these black hole systems. So this is how noisy the accretion flow is when we observe it in x-rays. And this, this is telling us something that the states and patterns of behavior we observe are not just modulated uh, by hardness, but there's some intrinsic noise in that as well. There's a timing process at play that changes uh, in lockstep with the, the hardness changes. So this is going to be sort of critical to uh, our understanding the rich phenomenology of these intricate black hole systems. But in juxtaposition to this rich pattern of behavior I'm showing you here, black holes are astonishingly simple. They're the simplest objects in the universe. They're described entirely, the no hair theory tells us, by just their mass and their spin. All the information, all of the uh, molecular bonds, all of the complex information that was a part of everything that went into the, uh, the star and fell into the black hole after it was formed <laughs> is radiated away. And all you're left with is two numbers that tell you everything there is to know about a black hole. This is so uh, remarkable. I'll, I'll give you a better quote than, than I could provide myself in a few slides here. But this is really something fundamental, something bizarre, and something remarkable that the universe has to offer us. And uh, the story I want to tell you today is that Jeff dedicated his career in the early days to measuring mass for the first time, providing the first dynamical evidence that there was uh, a black hole system. There was a real black hole uh, in the universe, in our galaxy, before this was widely accepted. And then uh, the work that I participated in um, for my thesis and in Jeff's later career to measure the spins, which he referred to as the most uh, fulfilling part of a very um, fulfilling career. So how is it that we go about finding black holes in the first place? Well, unfortunately, we haven't come up with anything better than waiting around for them to go bang. So uh, right now, all we can do is sit around uh, with X-ray detectors that are looking at all parts of the sky or monitoring as many patches of the sky as regularly as possible and wait for something new to show up. That, uh, we don't have a better system yet devised to detect black holes than that. But fortunately for us, any new black hole in our galaxy that goes off uh, gets so bright that we are certain to detect it. Um, and roughly this is a cadence of a couple per year, thereabouts. But it's, uh, it's 
both frustrating and challenging to think about how we can do better than this and discover systems uh, that are um, not uh, in enormously bright in active outburst. But presently, that's, that's where we're mostly stuck. So we wait for something to go up into outburst. We identify its optical counterpart, and then we wait for it to get quiet in the x-rays for the outburst of this very bright avalanche of gas in the accretion disk to fade and diminish until the system becomes quiet once more. And when it's quiet, we can go about measuring the dynamics of the system. And just to illustrate this for you in a concrete way, this is showing you GX339-4, which is sort of the canonical uh, prototype of black hole x-ray binary systems. This is showing you uh, several outbursts of GX339, actually, but this is showing you how it rises in a hard state, transitions across to a soft state. This is all in a matter of several weeks. It typically spends several months declining in a soft state, and then over a period of a few more weeks will go back into a hard state and fade into quiescence. So this is the typical behavior. Uh, GX339 is one of the few that's had recurrent outbursts, so every five or so years you get another bright outburst and it goes through the same pattern again. But when it's in this quiescent phase, uh, we're able to do some um, fantastic complementary science. That as we go about measuring the dynamics of the system, and this was how uh, Jeff was a part of identifying the first concrete black hole system. This is A0620-00, um, identified by Jeff McClintock and uh, uh, Ron Remillard as a black hole uh, for the first time in 1986. This was the thing that uh, proved to the community that uh, black holes uh, were bona fide real uh, systems. And this is now a much richer data set by Joey Nielsen from uh, a little over 10 years ago, showing you a beautiful sinusoidal curve. This is the radial velocity of the companion star orbiting around the black hole. So we're seeing it, the Doppler shift as it moves uh, away from us and towards us. And by tracing out uh, the simple period and semi-amplitude of the system, uh, you end up with a very lovely uh, relationship here that defines a mass function that is in fact a lower limit on the mass of the compact object. The thing that Jeff and Ron found was that this mass, this, this lower limit on the mass, was above three solar masses, known to be above the highest possible mass for a neutron star. It had to be a black hole. Um, this is uh, in a little more detail showing you that this quantity is related to the compact object's mass, uh, uh, modulated by the sine cubed of the inclination with respect to the line of sight. And Q here is the mass ratio of the companion star to the, to the black hole. So we, uh, in fact, have techniques that we've developed for measuring uh, I and Q using the fact that these companion stars are tidally locked um, uh, so that one orbital rotation corresponds to one rotation of the star itself. Uh, that allows us to, vi to devise uh, Q sine I um, through a relationship called the Eggleton uh, relationship. Um, the punchline being that if you can measure how broad your lines are, you can determine um, V sine I. And then inclination itself we measure by looking at this double uh, ellipsoidal modulation as a function, uh, and, and this is uh, a light curve of the, the system as it's orbiting around. It gets uh, brighter twice and fainter twice each time it orbits around because of this cool and faint tip on the front of the star and this large area that you see when you get the full teardrop shape of the tidally distorted uh, companion. So uh, these observables let us cleanly get a dynamical mass for a black hole. Again, this was done for the first time in 1986 by Jeff and Ron. And with that, I've told you half there is to know about a black hole. But that was the simple half, and the less exciting half, frankly. So I'd like to move on to telling you about spin. Um, and as I said, to really impart the, uh, the wonder and the shockingness of the existence of black holes that are describable by just mass and spin, I want to give you a quote better than uh, what I could provide on my own. Uh, this is the great uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who Chandra is named after, um, who said, in my entire scientific life, uh, and again, this is the Chandrasekhar, the most shattering experience has been the realization that an exact solution of Einstein's equations of general relativity discovered by Roy Kerr 
provides, provides the absolutely exact representation of untold numbers of massive black holes that populate the universe. That is, that black holes are real objects described by only mass and spin. That was, to Chandrasekhar, the most shocking thing in his scientific career. He gets poetic after that statement. Okay. And what are the sorts of things that we hope to learn by going about making these spin measurements? Well, there are some really fundamental questions to both physics and astronomy that we're uh, in the process of being able to assess with these measurements. For one thing, we're learning whether or not relativistic jets, which are ubiquitous in black hole systems, whether or not these jets are powered by the spin of the black hole or by an accretion process. This is uh, still a forefront subject, um, and the spin measurements I'll be telling you about have been um, integral in, in making some of these assessments. We're learning something very uh, fundamental about how black holes are formed um, and what the supernova explosion process is that, uh, that gives us a black hole. The, is the spin imparted at birth? Is the spin something that's accreted? This is something uh, we're in the process of learning. Um, and turning to systems other than the stellar mass, uh, how is it that supermassive black holes grow over cosmic history? And of course, um, we're as you, as you see from uh, gravitational wave measurements, and, and uh, it, we're in a, a new era where we're able to start using the kinds of techniques to tell us about uh, the black hole's properties, mass and spin, to assess something about whether or not uh, GR is correct. So something about fundamental physics itself. I, I would say we're not here yet for these kinds of techniques, but we're laying the groundwork to do those sorts of things uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum. But the basics for how we go about measuring spin are uh, wonderfully quite simple. So it so happens in, that if you take a particle, put it in orbit around a black hole in general relativity, there's a very important orbit. That is the innermost stable circular orbit, or ISCO. And if you put a gas particle in orbit at the ISCO and you flick it with your finger, it will either go further out into the disk and be fine, or it will plummet in a dynamical time into the horizon, never to be heard from again. So this special radius, the ISCO, uh, we think truncates the accretion flow uh, so that there is a hole around the black hole at the ISCO uh, that is outside of the horizon. And the location of that ISCO, importantly, changes monotonically as you change the spin of the black hole. So that is, if you take a, here a 10 solar mass black hole, it has uh, an ISCO out in GR units at 6M, uh, for, or 90 kilometers for uh, those of us who like to get anchored in some, some numbers. And if you have its cousin who is uh, the same mass but now maximally rotating so that its dimensionless spin parameter is 1, that ISCO creeps all the way into 1nm. So it's essentially the same value as the horizon. And, and these two extrema, a difference of a factor of 6 in radius, have enormously different observable uh, results. And that, inferring the, the location of this ISCO is really what we're measuring and allowing us to measure spin itself. This is just showing you uh, a plot of that uh, relationship. Maximally rotating at 1, uh, non-rotating at 0, and in fact retrograde spins are allowed in which uh, the disk is rotating in the countersense to the angular momentum of the black hole. So there are two techniques uh, in the x-rays that are currently being used to measure spin. There's a continuum fitting technique, and that's going to be mostly what I tell you about today. Uh, and there's also uh, an iron line technique, which is most commonly called the reflection method. Um, the continuum technique uses broadband uh, thermal emission from the accretion disk to tell us the location of that ISCO radius. The reflection me method tells us, uh, uses relativistically broadened line profiles to tell us about how close in that emission is to the black hole itself. Uh, telling us the location of the ISCO from the uh, red wing of that iron line. There are other methods, of course, uh, that exist. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, QPOs, quasi-periodic oscillations, that are a very uh, tantalizing um, prospect for making the most precise measurements of spin. And of course, as we all know, gravitational waves are revolutionizing our understanding of black hole systems. Though, of course, this is a very different population of black holes not located in our galaxy, but located uh, out in the cosmological flow. Um, and there's, uh, uh, there's going to be a new technique that will be on the sky in the next couple of years. Um, X-ray polarimetry has promised for measuring black hole spins as well. And um, 
we will have an X-ray polarimeter within the next uh, two years uh, if all goes according to plan. So first, continuum fitting. Continuum fitting is very simple and elegant. Um, so when I first was discussing uh, spin measurements with Jeff and Ramesh, um, I, I could tell Jeff loved this, but Ramesh loves simplicity in theory. And this, uh, I think it was Ramesh who, who uh, in fact, came up with this slide and made this point so well that um, you know any undergraduate uh, can walk away with, I think, a good sense of how we're doing things. So the way that we go about measuring the radius of a star that we can't resolve on the sky is we plop down a spectrograph, we determine a temperature. We know that a star emits roughly like a black body. And so that means that if we can measure a temperature and we have some measure of the total flux of the system, then we can determine a solid angle on the sky. So two observables, total flux, and temperature tells us a solid angle. And if we also know the distance from, for instance, uh, Gaia parallax, then that turns into a radius. So this is, this is how we go about uh, measuring the radius of, of stars and how this has been done for decades, uh, oversimplified, certainly. But by analogy, what we're doing now is changing from a spherical geometry to a cylindrical one. So we have one broken symmetry, we need now to know the projection inclination axis. And it turns out that, of course, a disk is not a single temperature black body, but it has a temperature profile. So we need some model to tell us what the flux profile looks like. But essentially, the, the core physics is the same. We're using black body emission with a simple temperature measurement and flux measurement, which we can get from a single X-ray observation. If we know distance and now inclination, we can determine the radius of the ISCO. Now, uh, to go to the true holy grail here, spin, dimensionless spin parameter, we also need to know mass. Mass is the scale parameter. So if we can get mass, inclination, and distance, we've measured spin from a single x-ray observation. Now to summarize that, uh, so some of the uh, logistics from the uh, observable end, we really want to have spectra where uh, you're dominated by the uh, component of interest. That is the thermal emission from the accretion disk. Again, we need theory to provide for us a model for the disk flux. Fortunately, this was uh, done rigorously back in the 1970s by Novikov and Thorne and then uh, Page and Thorne uh, with a small correction a year later. Uh, this is showing you the uh, emission as a function of radius for different spins. And you see that as you march along upwards in spin for a fixed mass accretion rate, you're getting more emission, it's, so it's getting brighter, and it's coming from closer and closer in. So it's getting hotter, and it's getting brighter, and there's a dramatic change you'll note, between non-spinning and something close to maximally rotating. This is what we're measuring. And lastly, um, I don't have time to go into detail in this talk, but I encourage anyone who's curious to ask me, uh, we often have to make the assumption that the black hole binary spin axis is aligned with the orbital, uh, uh, orbital ax uh, rotation axis. So uh, there's good reasons to believe in this, and we've done one important test of this. Uh, please ask me if you want to hear more. Okay, so let me give you a concrete example. This is showing you uh, a typical soft thermal state for uh, the black hole LMCX3. And what we're seeing here is a very bright accretion disk that's peaked at roughly 1 keV. So this thermal disk emission is what we're interested in modeling. This, we measure the temperature, and we measure how much flux we're getting. This is going to let us measure spin. There's also always this pesky non-thermal component. Now, for many folks, the non-thermal piece is their bread and butter. But here, thermal continuum fitting, we want to know what is that disk temperature and what is its uh, flux. And we can do that very reliably. You can see how much signal there is in this observation. Now, in practice, this turns out to work incredibly well, very reliably. And the best test of this was something I did as part of my thesis work, where we looked at LMCX3, which is one of the handful of persistently bright sources that's also very highly variable. So we can explore a range of luminosity. It's been observed with many different instruments separated by many years. This is showing you a light curve of LMCX3 going back into the 1980s. Uh, you'll recognize a suite of your uh, favorite X-ray detectors, um, the greatest hits uh, going back decades now, who have all looked at LMCX3. And we have 
uh, in total, around 750 observations of LMCX3 that we used. Um, for some detailed uh, reasons related to where, our, where we believe our model is reliable, we exclude both the very brightest end and the faintest end of, of, this, uh, uh, of this range. I'm happy to say more if anyone is curious. But with 450 data points here, what we do is we look at how consistently can we measure the inner radius with each of these observations. Again, some 400 plus observations. And we find consistency among an array of very different detectors uh, over decades to within about 5%, including all differences. So this is a, a remarkable validation of the idea that there is notionally a constant inner radius in these systems that, that is the ISCO, and that this is eminently measurable um, by continuum fitting itself. So this is uh, proof that there's a constant inner radius, but this is not actually proof that that inner radius matches the ISCO. And um, some of our colleagues working in uh, uh, GRMHD, the magnetohydrodynamics, questioned this assumption. And so this is showing you work from uh, Bob Penna when he was a graduate student here, just a simulation that Bob ran of an accretion flow onto a black hole where I've, oops, where I've marked the ISCO sorry, with this black vertical line. And so you see there's gas flowing into the ISCO. It looks like there's gas flowing out. That's actually just patterns, so just a barber pole effect. But you're seeing an accretion flow here plummeting onto the black hole. And what we can do is take Bob's simulation uh, with all the state-of-the-art um, MHD code at the time, and we can make a, a simulated observation of that to test our assumption that that inner radius was, in fact, the ISCO and not some other location. And what we find is that, in fact, we were a bit wrong. Uh, we're not actually at the ISCO, which would, be, which would be the case if this dashed line matched the solid line. But we're within such a small epsilon that this is negligible compared to our observable uncertainties in mass, inclination, and distance. So uh, the punchline is this continuum fitting method is uh, very strongly underpinned uh, and in fact, the enterprise of measuring black hole spin is, is most strongly underpinned by the state of the art in theory and the state of the art in, uh, uh, in data, which is LMCX3 itself. So uh, we went ahead, uh, we measured the mass of LMCX3, we measured its inclination and its distance, and this is showing you the final result we have for its spin. So this is showing you really the measurement units up top, that is the, the location of that ISCO radius is this top axis, and how that maps into spin is here on the bottom axis. There, there's a quite nonlinear relationship between the two. So this is the quantity we actually measure. This is the quantity of interest. And it turns out that the spin is about 0.25. It's a low spin source. And this is the most precise measurement of this inner radius that we've been able to do to date. And this is incorporating all of the, uh, not only all of our uh, statistical errors, but all of the uh, systematics that we could uh, explore. So that's continuum fitting in a nutshell. And I want to also touch upon the other major technique by which spin measurements are made. This is the so-called reflection or iron line method of measuring spin. Um, so continuum fitting, this is now a, 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 not a very elegant cartoon, I'm afraid. But this is a cartoon showing you a black hole with an accretion disk and some nebula around it. Now this nebula is a, a corona of hot electrons. <laughs> Uh, by analogy to the corona of hot electrons we see around the sun. Now, we don't know much about the shape of this corona, or, uh, and we have now some constraints on where it is located in some, some circumstances, but generally this corona is more mysterious than it is constrained. Uh, this is responsible for that non-thermal blue piece I showed you in the spectrum earlier. And uh, the cause of that uh, non-thermal emission is the Compton scattering of uh, emission from the thermal emission from the accretion disk, uh, where a photon, an X-ray photon, runs into a, a hotter electron and gets upscattered in the corona, and some of that emission, it turns out, will uh, scatter backwards and illuminate the accretion disk. When that happens, a reflection component is produced. This induces uh, fluorescent emission and a continuum of emission, and this so-called reflection spectrum here uh, is shown in blue in the rest uh, wavelength or in, in the, uh, the rest frame of the gas. And in red, I'm showing you what the observer sees when this is convolved with all relativistic effects around the black hole. That broadens uh, these features appreciably. And just to 
walk you through this um, a, a little more uh, uh, piecemeal. This is showing you now uh, a marching in of line emission uh, from far out in the disk to close in in the disk. So this is emission uh, now coming out from far away where relativistic effects are quite minor at 400 RG. And you see the classic double horned line profile. And as you go in, you see that you start to get Doppler boosting. So special relativistic effects start to take hold. You're boosted on one end, deboosted on the other. Uh, but then as we go further in, you'll see that there's a net redshift as well as the gravitational redshift becomes important. So this is all the uh, emission losing energy on its way out of the potential of the black hole. And when you put that together, integrating what line profile you expect to see from a black hole uh, that's emitting iron everywhere in its disk, you see a canonical profile like this, peaked at something like 6.5 keV, with a mission that extends down to a few keV. This very extreme broad red, red wing is uh, the hallmark of reflection emission. And, uh, and the extent of the reddening of that wing is what we use to tell us about the spin of the black hole. So you can see here, comparing the same non-spinning black hole to its maximally rotating cousin, we see that there's uh, an extreme red wing on the tail of the ex extreme spin case that is not present for the non-rotating black hole. So it is by modeling this signature that we go about uh, measuring spin. And, and uh, this is showing you now the highest signal um, uh, reflection spectrum that had ever been obtained at the time. This is uh, really fantastic work by Javier Garcia taking the entire RXTE archive of mm -hmm. observations of GX339, that same canonical black hole I showed you earlier, uh, and putting together a 44 million count spectrum that shows this broad iron line here and the associated, this is the, the Compton hump that has really uh, been used extensively now in the age of New Star uh, as a, a further anchor for reflection modeling and measuring spin. So this is showing you those lines and the performance of uh, Javier's leading uh, reflection model, RELZIL, which you see does a, a quite good job measuring the spin of this black hole. So that's the techniques in a nutshell. And um, I would like now just to say a few more words about how it is that in practice we go about uh, taking these measurements and put these in some context. So um, this is again showing GX339 as it goes through its, uh, its outbursts as seen with RXTE. The places that we go to measure uh, thermal continuum fitting spin are over here where the disk dominates in soft states. And you can see that these soft states are typified by very low RMS noise. So that is, it's not flickering, it's very stable, and almost all of the emission is coming from an accretion disk. By contrast, when we want to make the reflection measurements, we're specifically looking for times where the non-thermal piece is quite prominent. So actually out here, in these bright and intermediate phases uh, of hard, either hard states or intermediate states, that's where we tend to go about measuring spin with uh, reflection techniques. So it, it is the case that we generally cannot get the same, uh, take one data set and extract two spin measurements at the same time uh, simply because one method is optimized when the other one is uh, hampered. But it is the case that we can take one source and wait for it to evolve over a time scale of weeks or months from one state to another and use the aggregate of those data to make our spin measurements. And uh, with that in hand, let me now show you the census of black hole spin measurements that we have now uh, as a community um, over the last uh, roughly 15 years that this has been a serious enterprise of making these spin measurements. So I've ordered this list roughly by spin with high spins up top, low spins at the bottom, and you'll see that we have a, a, a wider range of spins produced by nature going from essentially non-spinning to maximally rotating. That didn't have to be the case, but that is what nature affords us. Uh, and you see that um, there are a handful of systems where we have measurements with both continuum fitting and iron K. And to save your eyes a little bit of trouble arranging things, I've highlighted in, uh, in yellow here cases where we're in very good agreement between the two methods. And in blue, a couple of cases where we have significant tension between the two methods, uh, roughly at a level of, I would say, two sigma kind of disagreement. Um, over the last few years, we've tried to examine these two sources to see if we can understand the, the nature of why uh, there's 
discrepancy here, and, and there hasn't been clear resolution yet. But this is it. This is roughly two dozen black hole systems for which we've gone about measuring, uh, measuring their spins. And again, nature provides the full range of possibilities. I'd like to uh, just put up a, a quick comparison. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I just want to highlight that both <coughs> me methods are uh, determining spin by measuring that ISCO radius. Um, they're using uh, different features, of course, and they're measuring in different states. But I want to mention that um, the continuum fitting technique is really tuned for stellar mass black holes. We would love to take this uh, to AGN systems. In fact, I've been in discussion with some, some folks here about how we might do that. But it turns out it's significantly more challenging for a number of uh, reasons. This is really mostly and best suited to stellar mass black hole. <clears throat> the reflection method, by contrast, is our avenue into the spins of AGN. So already this has been done uh, for many dozens of systems. And Laura Brenneman here is uh, uh, one of the very leading experts on that. And uh, anyone who is interested in that should I encourage you to, to talk to Laura. The great advantage to the continuum fitting approach is that the model complexity is very low. It's about as simple a model as you could ever hope for. Um, by contrast, the reflection method has a, a rather high complexity to it. It depends on having some understanding of the coronal geometry, or at least a prescription for that geometry. And one often has to make some simplifying assumptions about the disk atmosphere structure, how the ionization and density pro profiles go. So that's, um, that's a significant challenge. The continuum fitting challenge is really going about measuring mass, inclination, and distance and bringing that externally to the X-ray data. That's why um, in this table, <coughs> excuse me, we don't have a fuller census of the continuum fitting spin measurements. So we're going about making um, these mass, inclination, dis distance measurements from the ground, and we'll fill in that table as we go. So um, with that as sort of the census of the state of the art, I'd like to turn to what does the future hold for our approach to, to interrogate spin and measure this fundamental of black holes. So the first uh, thing I want to mention to you all is that there is this very tantalizing, exciting possibility for, uh, for spin measurements that has been known for, uh, for well over a decade now. That is, we find that it's some very... Uh, isolated moments in time, so the black holes produce these high-frequency QPOs, and they produce them in a very specific 3 to 2 resonance. So this is uh, showing you here a census of some of these measurements for uh, various black holes. If you have a favorite telephone number, check for it here. But you'll notice that the same source here, 1550, has uh, frequencies in one observation, 184, 276, and a later observation, 184, 276. So these are 3 to 2 ratio QPOs that are stable in time, uh, stable frequencies for, the, 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 uh, for a given source, so it's repeatable. And um, we find that this is mostly uh, manifest only when the system is about to produce a strong ballistic jet, and then it goes away. So we've been looking for more and more of these systems that we only have a handful, and frustratingly, we only have a handful, uh, in fact, four, where we have both high-frequency QPOs and spin data. So what's special about these resonant frequencies and these, uh, these QPOs? Well, this, uh, this kind of frequency range is exactly matched to the dynamics at the ISCO. So this is where you would say the Keplerian frequency is at, at the ISCO. This is that same ballpark. The fact that they're stable makes us think that they're from a fixed structure in the system most obviously would be the ISCO, and the fact that um, uh, they've been observed only um, infrequently uh, makes us try to rise to the challenge to get uh, more measurements of this uh, phenomenon. So right now we're trying very hard with NICER and Astrosat to hunt for more of these. So with only a few measurements, right now we're in a situation where we have many more models than we do data points, and it's not clear which is correct. That's not a position you want to be in. Um, what's encouraging is that all of these models are capable of making very precise measurements of spin. So in fact, um, these are uh, an order of magnitude or more, more precise than we can do with either continuum fitting or reflection. But again, 
we have too many models and we haven't been able to calibrate what the correct uh, model is yet. So this is to be determined, but um, X-ray timing missions like NICER and Astrosat are where our hopes are to make this critical headway. Uh, and if we can crack this egg, then we will be in uh, tremendous shape to really propel the state of the art in, in spin measurement um, to a, a new generation. And so this is low frequency data. This, these are not high frequency QPOs, but I just wanted to, for eye candy and somewhat out of frustration of not having Q, high frequency QPOs to show you, just give you a sense of what it is that we're looking for, what this would look like. So these again are low frequency QPOs observed with nicer for a black hole, maxi 1535 minus 57. So these are at a few hertz, about uh, two and five hertz. Um, what we're looking for is these kinds of features uh, roughly this strength, but up here in the hundreds of hertz range. So we are still waiting for uh, a new black hole to, to show us um, show us these features. We can measure its spin and try to get this calibrated. But what I'd like to also turn to is what we can hope for in the near term in the future. So uh, what's quite exciting, and we heard a little bit at lunch about this, is uh, a domain where we're interesting where, where we're entering. Uh, uh, surveys with large data sets from the ground in the optical and of course in the x-ray we have new large area detectors coming online I certainly uh, well Athena certainly and then we're all hoping for links as well um, and a probe class mission is proposed uh, called Strobax which would be sort of a generational successor to nicer which I spoke about um, this afternoon um, and I just want to highlight that um, one of the things I showed in my lunch talk is that NICER is capable of getting roughly a 10% disk radius measurement every second for a bright black hole. So this is reaching the viscous time scale for the first time. This is tremendous. But what's astonishing to me is that with Strobex or something of its scale where we're talking about 10 meters squared or thereabouts effective area wise, you can get a 10% disk radius every 10 milliseconds. That's approaching the orbital time scale at the inner disk. This is getting to a dynamical uh, time scale range. This would be transformative. Um, in particular, this would enable us to do things like phase resolved spectroscopy of high frequency QPOs, if we can get some good high frequency QPO data, and allow us to uh, go a step further, like map disk structure at the viscous time scale. Um, this is just to highlight for you, to convince you that this is actually not a, a total pipe dream. This is showing you what a, a three crab source would look like with 15,000 counts in just a hundredth of a second with Strobex. Simulation, of course. And um, it's not only a matter of our ability to probe the black holes that we know about and can detect in our, in our own galaxy in new ways, but our ability to take what we've been able to do in our galaxy and extend it to the full domain of the local group. This is showing you uh, that same map by Jerry Arose, but now uh, extended to show you what we might see if we could look at the full uh, local group using Athena, uh, and in some cases using Strobex. In particular, if we can probe out to cosmological scales, which is something really um, not not so much in the domain of a Strobex instrument, which is non-imaging, but something with Athena, you can start to see uh, uh, X-ray binaries and systems at you know four, ten megaparsecs away, really uh, opening up our, our volume that we can uh, access X-ray binary systems. So this is showing uh, NGC 1313, which is home to um, uh, one of the favorite ULX systems that uh, that is regularly studied, and this is showing how well you can isolate um, a given X-ray source from uh, the confusion of its neighbors uh, with a couple of different apertures. So with that, um, I'd like to leave you with um, the main takeaways here. So there are two primary spectroscopic techniques that we're using in X-rays to go about uh, measuring the spins of stellar mass black holes. There's continuum fitting and reflection. We see that the two methods themselves have uh, delivered little more than a, a dozen measurements apiece. And so in total, we have uh, roughly two dozen spin measurements uh, with about two sigma consistency between one another. Um, X-ray timing is a very promising avenue. If we can get it calibrated to measure spin, it will give us the most precise uh, measurements. 
And uh, while I, I didn't um, have time to adequately talk about it here, the growing results from gravitational wave measurements are just uh, such an exciting complement uh, to these techniques that we can do in our own galaxy. So this has been a very exciting time. Um, the foundation for the spectroscopic techniques is uh, empirically anchored in the existence of a constant inner radius. This is most, uh, most strongly demonstrated um, in the system LMCX3 for which we see that stability um, anchored for us. So again, we have roughly two dozen measurements at present, and I think it's uh, reasonable to expect that in the near future we can at least double that population and start to extend our view out from our galaxy uh, to the local group and maybe even start to go extragalactic. Right now we're working very hard to improve our precision um, and again calibrate this x-ray timing technique. Um, but I would like to end for you with a note uh, just showing a highlight of uh, the capstone of, of Jeff's career. So Jeff himself was instrumental in measuring masses and spins uh, of these 10 systems. So this, uh, this uh, tremendous legacy is complete knowledge of these 10 black holes and um, I am enormously amazed by uh, Jeff and his perseverance and I'm enormously excited that uh, this was something that he achieved in his career and that I got to be a part of such a, a tremendous legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And, um, uh, it's also important to mention that uh, one of the greatest satisfaction that a mentor like Jeff could have had is to have a student like you. So, thank you. Um, the, I, I couldn't uh, avoid thinking that the window that you described to black holes is a traditional window that was extremely successful, the only game in town for decades. But now there are two contenders uh, you know, on the block that yeah. could potentially... So one of them is obviously gravitational waves, you know, LIGO and future extensions of it. There is another one that uh, you know, might actually be quite useful, and that's Gaia in finding binaries that have a dark companion that is very massive. But just speaking about the gravitational waves, which already give us some statistics, uh, it seems like there is a clear discrepancy between the results that they provide and those results in the sense that, you know, most of their black holes are much more massive than most of your black holes. What do you make of it? This is, this is true, and it's been, um, sorry, uh, close your eyes while I flip through here to, to this slide. Yeah, this is showing um, uh, with the size of each of these dots matched to the, um, the, the mass of the black hole. This is showing, the, the, they call it the x-ray measurements. So these are the x-ray binary systems that we've measured the masses for in comparison to the gravitational, uh, the merging, these are the progenitor uh, black hole systems in green. And you notice that these are lar much larger on the whole. And so I think... What this is telling us is that we're probing two different populations, and the reason for it, I, I don't have, I, I'm not authoritative enough to give you a firm answer, but I will tell you my speculation, which is that um, I think in both cases we're looking at binary systems that are relatively compact, but I think it's quite likely that um, while the, the black holes that we observe in our galaxy, which are none of them um, in globular clusters, um, May, some of them may have originated there. I uh, speculatively will suggest that it's possible that these uh, larger, more massive black holes formed in dense environments and had uh, supernova explosions of a different character where they may not have received a kick that ejected them from the cluster. And if so, they're in this very dense uh, environment where most massive objects would tend to sink to the center, uh, potentially being able to merge through three body interactions, um, which would give you a different character uh, than we have from the population we observe in our galaxy. But I think, to me, this is just enormously exciting and it's illustrative of why it's important to make these kinds of measurements with different techniques because I think, uh, you know, beforehand, actually the original gravitational wave event was essentially off the charts and mass for them. They weren't looking in that window. That was, that was at the very corner of what, what was being searched for. So this is, 
you know, who, who would have thought this is really... But there is another important new. implication because they were, the psychology of the LIGO collaboration for decades was to build up a library of templates mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the signal, will de they expected the signal to be just a little bit above the noise so they would fish out the signal with a template, yes. the library. Once they saw the first event, it was clear that they can see it with their own eyes, you know. So nature was very kind to us in a way, compared to what the expectations that were based on your, your data. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah I, I do have a question, but I, I just wanted to say that the way I got to know Jeff was because he was here every Saturday. So this persistence of, you know, working hard, and this was really around the time before the spin, but, you know, working on the mass and establishing that there is a population of black holes in the galaxy, he was on the job all the time. Yes. So that said, now I'm going to ask you a question, which actually may be related to Avi's question. Um, because one of the things that that leaks out when you look at the arose like diagrams that you showed <coughs> is that for the wind systems, none of those stars, and that is drawn to scale, if I remember yes. correctly, yes. none of those stars are large giants. They may be evolved stars, but they are not on the large end. None of them has a, a radius close to an AU, for example. This is true. Uh, when we look at other galaxies and we look at some of the uh, very luminous X-ray sources, some of which are thought to be black holes, some of which are neutron stars, uh, but these are the most luminous ones, occasionally thought to be candidates for more massive black holes. Some of them seem to have super giant companions. And so I've been looking at this a little myself lately, and I'd like to ask now the expert, do you have a, an idea as to why the set of donors that you see in a diagram like this doesn't extend to much larger stars? I know time scale is part of the answer, but beyond that. I, I think that's a great question. I, um, <coughs> I don't have a, a good answer, I, and I just speculatively, I wonder if, um, you know, if you form, if, if you're in a position where you have such a large binary, if that might lend itself to sort of a common envelope scenario, which would essentially drag the black hole in and eject a lot of that envelope and leave you with just a core to accrete from. I, th I think it's, that's, again, just speculation. I think that's enormously interested in, in, interesting, and I, yeah, I, I haven't thought a lot about it. Yeah. By the way, one uh, anecdote is that the black holes that uh, LIGO detects could merge within a Hubble time only if they start with a separation that is less than a few times the progenitor size. Unless you have mass transfer from a third star. Yes, that's, that's a caveat. Yes. So looking at the distribution of spins that you were putting in from Jeff's, uh, it seemed like the wind feds were obviously much, much mm -hmm. faster and the, the transients had a wide range. Yes. Do you care to comment on what, what sets the distribution of those spins? Yeah, well, that, so that's a very, um, it's, it's a great question. And I would say it's uh, small enough number, number of statistics that I shouldn't, um, I, it would be dangerous to over speculate. Let me try to speculate ahead. <laughs> flip to that. But, um, you know, I think it's an indication, uh, let me say Tassos Fragos did some really excellent work trying to just ask the question of, is there enough time to accrete the spins for all of these black hole systems? And the answer for the most massive companion star systems, you won't be surprised, is that no, they're, they're high spin and they have high mass companions that are ticking time bombs that detonate before, um, actually, yeah, I think, I think that one will be more clear. So, so yeah, the time scale is just not sufficient to accrete for these, um, these wind-fed binaries here. Um, where you see the, uh, well, the, the black hole masses are larger, but especially the spins are larger, and the companion masses are also sort of tens of solar masses. Down here, the, um, where the spins are sort of widely distributed from zero to maximal, um, Tassos found that there was sufficient time to accrete the spin for every system except Jiris 1915, which breaks all molds, was a little too extreme for, it, for him to be able to accommodate. But the story that works for Tassos uh, and, and his picture of binary evolution was that you could form 
uh, a binary um, uh, with essentially lower mass and zero natal spin and spin all of these things up via accretion of the, uh, of the donor star. And all of these systems had to be formed with very high spin at birth. So this would, again, be pointing to two different uh, supernova processes. Um, these, I will note, all have higher mass than uh, these guys here, with the exception of Jiris 1915, but that's a consistent story. To make them with very high spin at birth, you need to make them from a disk in the core of the star. So there needs to be some disk there as well. Well, I, I mean, if you, take the, if, you, if you were to take the sun and trap its angular momentum into, uh, into a black hole, um, I, I, I forget the precise number, but you would have something like uh, 2,000 times the maximal angular momentum of a black hole. So it's, there's enormous amount of angular momentum and even something uh, slow spun down like our sun uh, to support that. Now, if you, but you do have to transfer that to a core, it's true. But the angular momentum reservoir is there for all of these systems. Um, let's start with Carl and then Ramesh. So I'm going to fight because I've always just wondered, but what happens if the spin is misaligned from the, uh, from the disk? Wonderful. That's great. So uh, there are a lot of interesting things that, that may happen. So one of the explanations for why we get QPO features in black holes, a, a popular model is that that's caused by a warp in the disk because it's misaligned with the binary plane, and so you see that as a QPO. But as a result of this warp, you also induce a torque on the black hole that will cause it to align with the binary uh, orbital plane. And if you ask, well, what is the relative angular momentum between you know, this massive, maximally rotating black hole and some wimpy star that's orbiting around it at uh, a solar radius or two? Well, it turns out that that wimpy star has about 100 times more angular momentum than your black hole. And in something like 10 to the 7 years of accretion, you've torqued it into alignment. But that's, uh, but that's assuming some degree of efficiency. So um, depending on models for this, you expect something in the neighborhood of 1% to 10% of black hole systems um, just by random draw would be, um, uh, would be misaligned now if they all formed with sort of random orientation uh, at some early phase. Now, um, I'll just skip ahead to say there, one of the frustrating things is there's very few instances where we can actually test this. Um, for this one lovely system, XDJ1550, uh, we were able to take advantage of these X-ray jets that were detected at large scales years after outburst and radio data and just uh, uh, adopt a, a, a blast wave model for the propagation of these jets to place a constraint on the inclination of the system, um, of, of the jet from the system, and compare that to the binary orbital uh, uh, angle. And what we find is that it has to be relatively close to a line. This is showing you um, now the plane of the sky where this band shows the, uh, the orbital angular momentum, which could be, um, which we don't know the position angle for. And this is showing you the results from the jet, which have a very fine uh, position angle and, um, and inclination determination. And so it has to be within about 12 degrees, at least, projected along our inclination. So this is one case where we could test it, and it looks aligned. We would love to have more instances where we can test the theoretical expectation that they should be aligned, but we just don't have those in practice. We're running a little over time, but last question for Mesh. Uh, yeah. So, so Jack, you described two methods. The, the reflection method and continuum fitting method, both of them assume that the disk comes down to the east core. That's right. Right? <laughs> and you also showed us that the two methods actually use different spectral states. Yes. Which are mutually exclusive. And at least there is a lore, which to tell the truth, Jeff and I are responsible for. The lore says that in the soft state, Fine, the disk comes down to the ISCO. Yeah. In these other states, the disk probably does not come down to the ISCO. It's truncated at some larger radius. Yeah. And yeah. We thought there was a fair amount of evidence for that. But now if both methods give the same uh, correct spin, it means that in both of these states, the disk really is coming down to the ISCO. 
<laughs> is, that, is that a valid uh, conclusion? I, I would say that's uh, that's that's at least a a, re a a reasonable conclusion. Yes, though with the caution that um, many of the measurements are being done when the system isn't in uh, a faint hard state where we expect things are more truncated. But even there, um, recent studies with New Star that is giving us sort of the the best view into um, the uh, I guess the, the best re reflection data, the best uh, vision of the hard state. Um, many of those are showing that the truncation is sort of five to ten times the ISCO when you're in these very faint hard states here. So it's not great truncation. We think that so that indications are that that must happen somewhere down here as it's really fading into a deep quiescence. But measurements that are taken up here, uh, it, it's true, you, you could take the conservative uh, vantage point that those are just lower limits, but typically they're they're rather high, so it's still a quite high lower limit that you would establish if it is in fact truncated uh, a little bit away from the ISCO. So I would say that's at least a reasonable way to, to look at it, but it does appear that when you're up in this horizontal branch here, um, if there is truncation, it's just sort of a, a mild degree of truncation. It's not large scale. So Ramesh, that shows a lot of scientific integrity on your side. Uh, well, basically bringing up the point that your the law that you developed with Jeff uh, appears not to Jeff, be supported. Jeff got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say. Uh, I agree more. <laughs> but, but Jack got it right. So let's, let's see. thank uh, Jack again. Thanks.